Good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us. I'm glad you're all here. My name is Lauren Cortbein and I'm a marketing specialist here at GTT and we'll get started with our webinar here. Before we get started, <clears throat> excuse me, there are a few housekeeping items I'd like to go over. Uh, to avoid any distractions, we do have all participants muted. If you have a question or concern, please enter it into the question panel on your right and send me a note using the chat feature in the control panel. Tomorrow we'll be sending a short email with a webinar recording, related materials, and contact information. If you would like the presentation, please let us know and we'll send you a PDF copy. We do want this to be as interactive as possible, but because we have so many participants, if you have a question, please enter it into the question box in the control panel to your right and we'll address them at the end of the session. I'll bring them up as submitted at the end. If we don't get to your question or you would like to address a topic personally, please contact myself at lauren.courtbein at gtt.com and I will connect you with the right GTT resource. Again, we will be sending an email tomorrow with the webinar recording and that will also contain our contact information. Today we are presenting Migrating to New Preemption Technology, presented by Liam Kern, Solutions Engineer here at GTT. And with that, let's get started with our webinar. I will now hand the presentation over to Liam. All right, thank you very much, Lauren. Um, so as you said, uh, kind of the idea today is to talk a bit about um, what it looks like or what the possibilities are uh, from migrating from an existing uh, GTT installation of Opticom um, from either something like IR or GPS into uh, one of our centralized platform deployments. Um, that being said here, let's just kick this right off. So kind of the short agenda, um, I give a brief overview of GTT as a company uh, for any of you that may not know uh, everything about us. Um, I'll keep that fairly short. And then I'd also like to talk through just kind of preemption solutions in general, um, an overview of, of kind of what they look like and what they really do. Um, and then talk about specifically those technology migration use cases, right? So moving from legacy to centralized as well as an as-a-service option um, for deploying that. And then finally, I'd like to wrap up with some, uh, some customer success stories of where this has worked uh, out in the field today. All right, sorry, small audio glitch there. <laughs> um, so GTT as a company, why are we here? Um, really, we, we're here to cover what we call the mobility challenge. And that, in our view, kind of takes four parts. Um, one of those things is that, you know, as time is going forward here, we're seeing more and more urbanization, right? We're seeing a, a denser uh, population in kind of cities everywhere as people move in from outside and just generally as the population increases. So this presents a challenge to the city in general uh, just finding a way to get people moving more efficiently um, throughout the existing infrastructure. Um, one key component of that, of course, is public transportation. So getting our buses, our shared rides, all those things um, moving as uh, efficiently and as reliably as possible and keeping them on schedule. Another component of that, of course, is public safety, um, who is seeing a different set of pressures. Of course, uh, the increasing challenge to try and get uh, to a scene of an event um, faster and earlier, but also getting there safely without putting additional risk um, both on themselves and also the general populace. Um, and then really kind of helping cities target a world-class mobility system um, because that attracts more people, more business, um, and just creates a more successful environment. So those four things are really what we focus on as a company um, and trying to help where we can. Um, so GTT here, we're fond of saying that we provide a clear path for communities worldwide to smarter and safer mobility. That's kind of the shorthand version of that, that previous conversation there. Um, so what are our markets? Uh, our primary market, of course, one of the three is safety. So fire, police, um, EMS, basically first responders and helping them get there faster and safer. Um, transit, of course, helping buses and other shared ride vehicles, um, including light rail, um, and other modes get to where they're going on time and maintain a consistent schedule. Um, and then generally speaking, we we're also take a broader approach to just smart mobility in cities overall. So that includes things um, like freight traffic, uh, snow plows, et cetera, and, and actually pushing them to the city as well. Um, and to that end, we've had over 50 years of doing this uh, and have ended up with over 180,000 connected vehicles and intersections deployed worldwide. 
So the very basics, um, kind of how does the system work? Um, as a vehicle is driving down uh, by an intersection that has our Opticom system in it, it will send a request uh, for information uh, basically to the intersection and provide its details. On that approach, the request is made saying, I need some preemption or priority. The system verifies it and then calls for EVP or emergency vehicle preemption or TSP, uh, trans traffic signal priority. Um, and then the light will cycle to green or in some cases hold a green or truncate a red in order to provide a safer and faster passage. Kind of de depends on the deployment there. So that's really just how the basics of it actually work. Now what we're going to talk about here today is kind of what the different modes are and how we can go from some of our legacy modes into some of the more uh, flexible newer modes of making that request happen. So taking a look here at our public safety market, um, a couple quotes that we think were relevant uh, from the U.S. Fire Administration back in December 2017, they stated in 2016, the U.S., for example, vehicle crashes were the second leading cause of fatal firefighter injuries for the year, almost four times the previous year's total. So what this tells us is that there's a trend rising, um, largely due again to that, that population issue and increasing uh, requirements um, that we're seeing a challenge to keep the vehicles themselves safe, both the passengers of the fire truck as well as the passengers of the vehicles um, in the intersections they're traveling through. And the second one here from the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA, um, they said in October that same year in the U.S. there were 15,425 collisions involving fire department emergency vehicles with 700 firefighter injuries resulting from these collisions. Um, so we can see in both these cases we're supporting that view that this is a, a serious issue that really needs um, an approach to keep everyone safe on the road. So um, how can we help in that, right? When you look at uh, the NFPA standards, you've got specific requirements there for the travel time, um, both for the first engine and second company uh, to show up. In addition to that, you have the ISO ratings, which are providing external pressures to make uh, that time as fast as possible. Um, so those kind of conflict a little bit with the idea of trying to reduce accidents, right? Because generally speaking, increasing the safety means maybe driving slower, um, taking more precautions, et cetera. But in this case, we're trying to speed up the response time. Now, what we've actually seen, um, and, and according to external research, is that emergency vehicle preemption, as provided by, for in this case, uh, the Opticom system, can reduce accidents by up to 70% and can increase on-scene arrival times by up to 25% uh, faster, I should say. So decrease the time taken. All right, so why we're all here. If we look at those 50 years we've been doing this, um, we've been through a number of generations of technologies, and, and honestly, a vast majority of people out there today leveraging Opticom systems, um, not a vast majority, a majority of people out there today with the systems deployed are still using IR in one method or another. Um, now they're all what we call multi-mode systems. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but if you look back, we've had IR since day one, way back in 1970. And as we progress forward, it's been about 30 years of installation basis of nothing but IR. It was the primary option on the market. Um, coming to the early 2000s, and we developed what we call our Opticom GPS solution, which is a GPS radio-based preemption system that does not require the use of an IR emitter. So it's not a light-based system. It also increased the range up to about 2,500 or 2,600 feet, um, whereas IR you're talking probably more like 500 or 600 feet. Um, and then from there, we actually moved forward in kind of the, the early 10s, um, we started to deploy our centralized solutions. So the early centralized capabilities came uh, late 2000s, early 2010, um, and now we're actually in the era where we have a true centralized platform available today. Um, and then side by side with that, we also developed the multi-mode system, which is basically combining the IR system and the GPS radio system into a single unit to allow us to use uh, legacy environment uh, equipment, but also then kind of migrate forward with that. So that's one thing we'll talk about in here too. So if we talk about people who are, um, or agencies that are deploying a system today, uh, there's many different approaches you can take, of course, and, and they fall into, generally speaking, uh, five well-accepted categories of deployment. So you have your kind of your legacy deployment. Um, that would be kind of no V2X or V2, vehicle to something communication, right? So that's basically driving the lights. Um, there is no preemption. There's no priority. You're just going to go when you watch the lights and you go when the light is either changed or you can safely uh, traverse the intersection um, even when your light is not called. Then there's kind of the late majority, so that's going to be um, it, it, I, occasions where you have deployments for, say, IR, right? So legacy point-to-point -point communications, that would be infrared, um, or including some other systems out there that are available that weren't necessarily ours, like optical, or sorry, like sound or uh, visible light-based um, optical solutions. 
Then you move into the early majority. That's going to be modern point-to-point. -point. So that's going to be things like GPS radio-based communications. Um, and generally speaking, also remote management of those devices. So rather than going to the actual device to configure it, you could do it over something like a cell fiber Wi-Fi communication to set those up. Now, kind of what we're talking about today are going to be some of the early adopters, right? So integrated software solutions, um, which leverage both existing city and vehicle infrastructure. So using what the city already has in place at intersections that may not have any specific dedicated hardware, um, as well as the existing onboard communications of the vehicle. Um, and then there's at the very far right side, the innovators, um, which is essentially kind of the cutting edge of technology. And here we're looking at that as a fully integrated solution, leveraging IoT and third-party data sources and cloud technology. Um, to kind of take it into the future case. So, what does um, Opticom deployment look like today? Uh, now, this, this chart's got a lot going on in it, um, but what we want to point, pay attention here to is kind of on the left side, we've got our vehicles, and on the right side, we've got our intersections, and in the top, we have what we're calling our central platform. Um, so, on the left side of the vehicles here, there are a number of things you could be using, and, and today, many of you, I'm sure, if you're using IR, you have an Opticom vehicle unit, which is actually powering the IR box. If you've got multi-mode or GPS and you've got something probably like our 2100 um, in the vehicle, those are powering basically our point-to-point -point solutions, IR and radio. Um, you may also, if you were a transit agency, you might also have a connected vehicle computer in there providing additional detail to our units, um, and that could feed in uh, some logic as when, to when you actually make the request. Now, what we want to talk about today is the far end of this is if you take a look at the modem here, I hope everyone can see my mouse, if you take a look at the modem there, that's the part we're talking about where we would actually take now the vehicle information, push that up to the modem, and bring it up to our central platform and start using that as our pathway. So put our TSP request as opposed to the center part where you're seeing radio and IR straight to the intersection, we'll actually post it up to a cloud-based platform. Right. Now on the right-hand side of this, we also have the intersection, uh, which has our 764 phase selector in this case. That's the card that we actually use, our discriminator, if you will, that will actually uh, take the logic in and choose when to ask that controller for a preemption call. Um, also could have a radio input, could have an IR input. And again, back when we talk about that modem, we can send data down through the network, either through a modem or through a fiber connection, um, direct to that card to make a choice. So that would kind of be the early adopters. And then there's actually the kind of most advanced solution, the state of the art, is to come down through the network and actually talk directly to the traffic controller. We'll approach that in a little detail later. So this brings us to what we, what we often talk about, which is interoperability. Um, and the headline says it all. Interoperability is a must to make smart city solutions a reality. So when you're trying to consider a holistic platform, you're trying to minimize the amount of additional hardware you're putting on your vehicle, minimize the amount of hardware you're putting in the intersection, and maximize your investment, um, interoperability is a huge consideration. Um, and that's because systems today require integration with other technologies and smart solutions, you know, have to minimize redundancy. Um, we don't need to have three different modems in a vehicle, um, all to do three very specific things when we could get away with one and a shared sort of platform approach to that. So the question that remains this is how can we protect our investments while scaling with future technologies? Um, also, one of the kind of emerging trends we're seeing is that there is more and more of a demand for reporting and analytics, um, as well as providing real-time status of the system as it's being used. So in the past, uh, many of the deployments, especially in IR cases, um, there wasn't a whole lot of reporting that was collected. You can get some basic logs, but that's because there wasn't a lot of demand for that information. Um, kind of as we're moving forward here through time, though, we're seeing more and more requests for detailed logs and information speeds, entry times, if preemption is granted, what sort of factors we're weighing in on that, um, and then also being able to see those intersections in real time and judge their performance. So to that end, we've actually built in several tools for that into our platform, our central platform, um, and can provide that in additional detail as you migrate to the newer platforms themselves. Um, some of those reports include travel time reporting, so that would be things like uh, analyzing the runs by date and time or start and location, the vehicle name, and that helps you determine the average travel time or the longest or shortest travel time as well as the total runs along a specific corridor. Um, so that can be used both by transit and by, and by uh, public safety. And then system utilization is another key reporting set, and so that one you can analyze the agency, intersection, and vehicle usage. So you can actually see how many vehicles are running, how often, which ones are making the most requests versus the least requests. Um, and then break that down by groupings um, as you see fit. It also lets you see and assess if there are any unauthorized vehicles or unregistered vehicles. So it can help with things like um, either vehicles that shouldn't be having the equipment on them or old retired vehicles that are still somehow in the system. 
um, as well as sort of any mutual aid agreements could also be me measured and registered through the system that way. Um, there is also a capability for data integration with this same set of metrics that we're using for reporting analytics. So you can share the Opticom vehicle data, the quote unquote breadcrumb data from the GPS um, in real time using cellular data and other network integration. Um, you can also integrate that data into existing command center systems without needing to log into multiple systems. So we can export the data to a connection to, um, say, a centralized data lake or data warehouse that you might have uh, in use for other systems today. Um, and you can present that data in real time or store it for historical reporting. So there's many different ways you can handle the data and integrate it with existing systems or vice versa. So let's talk about how, what you need to consider when you're looking at a migration, right? Um, there's four key questions on here that we actually wrote out because they're important enough. Uh, one of those first ones is what are your primary objectives? What are you trying to get out of the actual migration itself? Is that because um, you just want to invest in newer technology, you've got some funding you want to spend, you want to get out of the way, you want to future-proof your investment? Um, or are you seeing that you need to start getting preemption earlier than the 600 to 700 feet you're seeing with IR? Now you need a, a half mile or maybe farther? Um, are you trying to collect more data and centralize it so you can run analytics on it and you can prove out things like your response times? Um, so the primary objective is going to drive really what direction you take um, with regards to where you're migrating to, because you've got a couple options there. Um, and then the next question, of course, after that is what infrastructure do you have today? Um, so do you have existing Opticom in the field? Is a great question. Uh, if you have existing IR emitters, are they attached to 764 cards? Um, or then some, some additional legacy hardware in the 750 series. Um, do you have any existing connectivity? So you have fiber networks, you have Wi-Fi, you have cellular. Is there anything to your intersections, your vehicles that you have that you, we can use um, or you'd like to use or leverage for this uh, a new deployment? Um, and then in the future, what are you expecting to implement? Is it, Do you have a five-year technology plan that you want to migrate the system into, that you want to integrate with or bring additional data or functionality to? Um, or is it just today that you're focusing on? So that actually covers, I jumped ahead a little bit to three there, the, what connectivity is available uh, to the vehicle's intersection. And of course, part of that too, if you're talking cellular modems, one big question is, is the data plan. Another big question is whether or not you want to leverage something like FirstNet. Um, so something definitely to keep in mind. And then lastly, but, but definitely not least, is who are the key stakeholders and, uh, and are they accessible? So um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, if you try to deploy something on your vehicles and that requires some intersection work, well, now traffic needs to get involved. So DOT needs to be aware of the work. Um, you know, are there other IT departments that need to be involved? Um, is there a centralized city communication network that, that we're going to be traveling across that we need to um, bring into the mix? So really just kind of identifying who owns what with, with uh, regards to the bounds of the system's approach. Now, on the vehicle side, specifically, when we talk about integrations and interoperability, um, the two big ones that come up to mind from a hardware standpoint is going to be the onboard computers. So if there's any existing computers on there today, and if we want to try and leverage any integration on that, um, and then any existing cellular modems and what types of modems they are. Certain modems have some functionality we can take uh, advantage of. Other modems just act as a conduit for data passing, which is also fine. Um, in some cases, some modems can't be used for anything but the singular purpose they're installed for, so you might have to add in a second modem for some uh, situations. Um, and then, of course, also there's tying into that the standards that we can leverage. So that's the CAN bus, um, which is basically the vehicle network, so it gives us information about the vehicle's operation. Um, J1708, which is sort of specific to transit. Um, and then any discrete I.O., so things like doors, flashers, um, sirens, whatever it might be, parking brake, um, and how we want to take that into the system. On the centralized side, um, there's several integrations that can happen there. So from a safety perspective, the CAD might be a good integration. Say, for example, if you're operating a police fleet and you only want to grant preemption um, under certain types of calls, um, we can integrate with the CAD to basically bring that information in, right, and actually adjust when a preemption call is made based on what type of call they're on. Um, secondly, integration to ATMS or your traffic management system um, maybe a major consideration because if we, if the ATM has to be integrated to, we might be able to skip having any intersection equipment, for example. And then, of course, any general APIs that you want to send uh, data to from the system. Uh, so that was kind of talking back where, uh, you know, we could take the data we have and send that to other systems, external data warehousing, so that you can create a centralized report for all your traffic management. And to that end, um, you know, the interfaces themselves are several different types, HTTPS, uh, MQTT, JSON, XML. Um, all varying methods for kind of creating that tie. 
And then from the intersection side, uh, the controllers is probably the biggest question. What type of controllers do you have today? Um, what version of software are they running? And what capabilities does that software have? Uh, for example, one major thing might be, is that particular piece of hardware um, NTCIP compliant? You know, can we send or connect to it or integrate through NTCIP to actually send messages rather than having a discrete input or output on there? Um, the second part of that is going to be modems, cellular modems, or fiber to the intersection. Um, just what kind of communication do you have, basically? And then, of course, the standards that we're looking to comply with. So I mentioned NTCIP. There's also NEMA, um, and there's the TS1, TS2 cabinet standards as just a small subset of all the varying standards in there. So, of course, the part that uh, not everyone likes to talk about at all times, but, you know, how do you actually procure it, right? So the money side of the equation. Obviously, the technology component is going to be the driver of this, um, but there are several methods that you can procure a system under. And specific to GTT, um, we offer kind of three primary modes of, of purchasing uh, a solution. One of those is a traditional capital purchase. So just as you would with anything else, you go out, you buy it, you own it, um, you pay everything up front, right? Um, it's also yours to manage, I should say. Uh, we also offer a managed approach where you can basically take a capital purchase, but rather than uh, you being the one to maintain it and configure it and set it up, um, we could do the managing of the system for you. So we would maintain the reports, the databasing, the server side stuff, um, but you would own all the equipment and, and its uh, associated components. And then lastly, there's as a service. So the as a service model is, is similar in concept to something like a subscription. Um, in the sense that there is no upfront fee, you're not paying a capital expense initially. There is a contracted term, and across that term, we own the hardware, we'll install it, we'll maintain it, we'll replace it, um, set everything up, provide reporting, and all of that. So it's essentially hands off. Um, effectively, it is it is a, a subscription fee for getting the green light, as we like to say. So. Um, looking at migration, legacy to modern, if you're talking about going to a modern, uh, what we call PCAS or, or priority control as a service type solution, um, you know, the main goals, thinking back to those questions, the main goals would be to reduce maintenance costs, so if that's a primary driver, um, optimize my traffic flow, so that's getting my preemption out there, um, be able to analyze my performance and support a multimodal approach, so actually be able to keep my legacy vehicles or my mutual aid in the mix. Um, while still being able to migrate my existing and new vehicles over to uh, the newer kind of centralized platform approach. So those are my goals. That would be the case where um, my option would be to leverage our modern PCAS approach to help us move from that legacy hour deployment. And if we look at this mapping again, we're going from kind of late majority to the innovator's side, and that's what we're really looking at there. So... Walking through this a little bit, kind of how we do that, we evaluate the current state. I've got IR emitters on my vehicles. I've got IR receivers at my intersection. I have an Opticom phase selector that's actually receiving the IR signal. And then I've got that wired up via discrete to a traffic controller. That's my current state of deployment in this case. So now I need to establish where connectivity is going to be added in in order to help us migrate. So I need to add a cell modem um, into the vehicle. And you'll notice I also have a cell modem at my intersection. Now, again, the intersection, we've got a lot of options there. It could be existing fiber could be Wi-Fi, could be a number of things. So here, then, we're kind of uh, taking the IR out of the equation. We don't necessarily have to remove it, because that can be a mutual aid thing. Um, but in this case, we're going to go primary with the cellular data connection. So what that actually ends up looking like is you'll see we have the cellular modem connecting to our central cloud in this deployment. And that cloud is then communicating back down to the uh, phase selector and the traffic controller at the intersection. And then we're keeping that IR emitter as, as a backup and uh, mutual aid support option um, on the vehicle. So we're not losing any capability, we're just adding an additional set of capability and flexibility to this um, as we kind of discussed the benefits of before. So that all being said, uh, walking through a, just a couple quick customer success stories. Um, there are several pilot programs in the Southeast that are specifically IR to a cloud hosted preemption uh, conversion. Um, and the main challenge there is that they've got legacy IR equipment that's becoming too expensive to maintain. It's just a lot of hands-on, um, you know, maintenance in general anytime you're putting hardware in the field. Um, and you need to maintain the preemption service while migrating to a hardware, as we're calling it, hardware light solution, right? The other part of that, too, is, of course, if you see that the header of the advanced preemption and clean traffic planning and regional mutual aid, uh, is that mutual aid is a big piece of that. So they don't want to just rip out the IR uh, because that can't be done day one and immediately replaced. 
with a brand new solution. So they need to keep that system in there while also then moving to a newer, uh, more modernized system. The solution to that then is to leverage that existing IR system while expanding preemption coverage to network connected. So that's exactly the situation we just walked through where we keep that in the vehicle, we add a modem, and we tie that into a network connection. So the results of that right now, uh, they're not complete, but the pilot programs are underway at several sites, um, and they are able to preempt using the centralized connection and the existing IR system. So the current deployment, um, even though it's still an evaluation site, we're seeing success for both that IR and the new centralized configuration um, for these two. Um, another customer success story, Harris County, so the emergency service districts, the ESDs, um, their particular case is a little different. They weren't using existing IR system, at least in all areas. Um, so their main challenge was actually evaluating a brand new preemption approach within the county, so a, a ribbon replace essentially. Um, but they wanted it to be NTCIP based, so they want to actually use a, a protocol based preemption on the system. Um, also, there was some existing radio and GPS in the surrounding region. Um, some Opticom specific, so mutual aid management was a big component of that. They want to be able to run those external vehicles that have our radio GPS solution through their intersections and still get preemption for them, but also for their own vehicles and the newer vehicles coming on, they want to enable a kind of a newer NTCIP based solution uh, out in the field. So what we actually provided in this case was a hybrid Opticom radio and cellular slash cloud hosted platform. So the intersections themselves actually contain both our face selector um, and our GPS solution, as well as network connectivity to our hosted cloud platform where they're making um, that request. They even have radio as a backup for the existing vehicles in case the cell service goes down. Um, the results of that is passed multiple performance tests and the final acceptance, um, and it's approved for sale in the county with a continuing expansion at a, at a pretty good pace. Um, and one last one here, talking about the city of Montreal. So a little different. Um, Again, from the, other, the previous ones, so their main challenge is they have regional multimodal planning. Um, so this is transit, EDP, all the rest of it. Um, they need to manage multiple types of vehicular movement in a single system. So the solution there um, is a centralized software-based priority control for both EDP, that emergency vehicle priority, and TSP, the transit signal priority. Um, I'm sorry, emergency vehicle preemption, <laughs> transit signal priority. Um, and that leverages their existing CAT AVLs in the buses, as well as their ATMS and their controllers. So it's really a broad um, approach to deployment because the city itself also, even in its own intersections and vehicles, uses multiple different solutions um, to achieve what they need. So this supports EVP for fire departments now, as well as police and snowplows in the future. Um, and it also provides relative priority. So what we're doing there is we're using schedule adherence and their route data um, and passenger count to trigger TSP. So we're actually not providing um, constant priority for the, uh, the transit vehicles. We're only doing it when it's needed based on the scheduled data. Um, currently in a deployment stage, but we are seeing success through that project today. So kind of make a brief summary here. Um, GDT is the market leader in preemption and priority control solutions. Um, innovations in technology give you more reliable preemption and more control. And Opticom provides a flexible deployment option that lets you upgrade without having to rip and replace your existing equipment. And at that, um, I'd like to bring it up for any questions. Awesome. Here. <clears throat> Thank you, Liam. Uh, like you said, we're going to go ahead and take some time <clears throat> Excuse me for questions. Uh, just a reminder to please type your questions into the question panel uh, to your right. Uh, so it does look like we have a few questions already. Uh, Liam, I know you covered some of this, but I'm just going to go over the questions in the order they were submitted. Uh, so can you discuss how mutual aid is impacted? Sure, good question. Um, so we, we covered that a little bit, but not specifically in detail. Uh, basically, if you have a system today and you're, and you're sharing um, access to that system with kind of the surrounding region, um, you can keep pretty much whatever hardware you have in place today, and we can help you migrate that to kind of a dual solution. So that's very similar to what Harris County is doing um, in that one success story. So if you've got IR at the intersection um, and you have 764 cards in there, it's a very small jump to basically take that up to a centralized solution for your vehicles while also keeping the IR available for any mutual aid. And same goes if you've got GPS today um, and you want to migrate that to kind of a central solution, um, we can also do it in that direction as well. All right, so this goes along with that one. Uh, so we recently put in new equipment. 
do we need to replace that to go to the centralized platform? Um, yeah, another good question. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, if you're getting new stuff, if you're replacing, even if you still have IR today and you haven't done anything else, if you happen to throw in, say, our newer uh, facelift cards, 764s, for example, um, those can actually be kept in, in most deployments. Um, now, we'd want to take that on a case-by-case -case basis. There are certainly some, some situations where we may need to replace the hardware um, or actually take a look at, at exactly what you want to do if you're going with a fully managed solution like a PCAS deployment. Um, but, it, yeah, no, it's definitely an option, a potential option to keep the hardware investment you've made today um, and while moving forward. All right, great. So it looks like we've covered all of our questions. Uh, Liam, is there anything else you wanted to cover before we wrap up here? Uh, no, I think that's it, and, and I just want to appreciate, uh, sorry, I appreciate everyone taking the time today. Uh, so thank you very much for taking time on a busy week and, and um, listening to our presentation. Great, thank you. So again, we will send out the recording and related content tomorrow. If you would like, please let us know. Uh, if you have any other questions or further interest, please contact us directly, and we'll arrange a time for you to speak to the correct GTT resource. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.